Good morning, everyone. I'm Rob Satloff, the director of the Washington Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this very special event. Um, there was a time, oh, not too long ago, there was a time when American presidents gathered people at Camp David and refused to let foreign leaders out until they signed on the dotted line. There was a time when American secretaries of state traveled the world and those travels made headlines. And there was a time when Middle East peacemaking was at the center of American foreign policy. None of those things really apply in 2021, but they may. One never really knows. And lessons, at least, from that period still apply to leaders today. Uh, we still need to learn, both Republican and Democrat, how to make deals, how to use the leverage, um, how to use the assets, how to use the goodwill of the United States to achieve breakthroughs for peace. And today, we're taking a step back, drawing on the lessons of the achievements of three very different individuals, three de very different leaders, three, three very different peacemakers, all of whom have a pref impressive accomplishments to their record. And we're doing that with three terrific biographers. It's a very special opportunity to gather together Stu Eisenstadt, Susan Glasser, and Martin Indyk, who have written over the last uh, few years, um, collectively, three outstanding biographies of three American peacemakers. Uh, Stuart Eisenstadt, former Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, who served a generation ago as head of the Domestic Policy Council um, in the White House under President Carter, was the author in 2018 of President Carter, The White House Years. Susan Glasser, staff writer for The New Yorker, is co-author uh, with a, uh, a gentleman to whom she is related, but unrelated to the topic of her book, uh, co-author with Peter Baker of The Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of James A. Baker III, Secretary of State, under George Herbert Walker Bush. And Martin Indyk, most recently, just now, uh, uh, the author of the highly acclaimed uh, Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. Martin, of course, being the two-time U.S. ambassador to Israel. And this is a study that I know that draws, has attracted Martin's attention all the way back to when he was a graduate student. So I'm really thrilled that we have um, uh, uh, Martin, Susan, and Stu together to talk about Henry Kissinger, Jimmy Carter, and James Baker, and the lessons that we can draw today from their peacemaking experiences in the Middle East. Uh, friends, uh, uh, I'm going to invite all of you who are joining for today's event to participate by sending questions in that we can use in our Q&A discussion uh, later in today's program. If you do have a question that you would like to filter into the conversation, if you're on Zoom, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom bar. And if you are not on Zoom on some other platform, including all the many people watching this live on C-SPAN, please send your questions directly to me at rsatloff, at washingtoninstitute.org. That's R-S-A-T-L-O-F-F -F, at Washington Institute, one word, dot O-R-G. All right, with that, I'm going to turn the forum over to our panelists, um, who I asked to make brief remarks um, uh, addressing the following. Why was Middle East peacemaking so important? And what is the unique contribution that uh, that the, um, uh, uh, the object of your research, Kissinger, Carter, Baker, uh, gave to the effort to achieve Middle East peace. Um, so we're going to first turn to Martin. Uh, we're going to do this uh, uh, chronologically. We're going to go Kissinger, Carter, Baker. So first turn to Martin, 
uh, then to Stu, and then to Susan. Martin, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Rob. And of course, uh, delight to be back at the Washington Institute uh, and to be on this panel with uh, Susan and, and Stu. Uh, so I'll jump right in. Why uh, was Kiss did Kissinger devote so much time and energy to his Middle East diplomacy? In fact, the four years that he was Secretary of State was almost entirely devoted to that uh, challenge. And uh, it was not his original intention. Uh, when he came into government as Nixon's uh, National Security Advisor, he knew little about the Middle East. He'd traveled six times to Israel before that, but he'd never traveled, set foot in the Arab world, um, didn't know about it, didn't care to know about it. Uh, he thought that uh, he had worked out a kind of stable order in the Middle East uh, in which Israeli deterrence in the Middle East heartland and the Shah of Iran's deterrence in the Gulf basically maintained order together with detente with the Soviet Union and an agreement between the superpowers that they wouldn't stir it up in the Middle East. But Nixon was pressing him to do something uh, to stabilize it further. Uh, and uh, therefore he decided that before the war of 1973 broke out, that he would launch an initiative after the Israeli elections, uh, which were set to take place at the end of October 1973. Uh, but he didn't believe anything would come of it. And he said that to Assad after the war. Uh, so therefore, he was never, uh, before the war took place, he was never really that interested in uh, trying to make peace. Uh, he readily admitted that he knew nothing about 242. And, and the details of Middle East diplomacy. Uh, the war uh, of 1973 changed everything. It came as a surprise to Israel and it came as a surprise to him. And uh, nevertheless, he recognized very quickly that it created an opportunity to do something that he and Nixon had wanted to do for some time, which was to sideline the Soviet Union. We were then in the midst of the Cold War and he saw the opportunity to sideline the Soviet Union in the Middle East. That was his primary uh, objective uh, once the war broke out. But he came to recognize that the war created a plasticity uh, in which he could mold uh, the actors in a way that would create a new American-led order in the Middle East. And that's what he set about to do. Once engaged, he quickly became hooked. Uh, and that's a phenomenon that uh, I'm sure that... Uh, Stu and Susan will uh, recognize uh, in their own uh, actors. Uh, and he was already at that point a star uh, in his own right, but he quickly became a celebrity uh, superstar as a result of his, the cachet that came with uh, the role of Middle East uh, peacemaker. And he appeared multiple times on the cover of Time and Newsweek. The most memorable one was Henry Kissinger dressed in a, in a Superman uniform with a super K on his chest as the great peacemaker in the Middle East. Uh, what was his unique contribution uh, to diplomatic success? I call uh, the title of the book Master of the Game um, because Henry was master of the game of moving Middle Eastern leaders to places they would rather not go, what I regard as the basic definition of diplomacy. And it's important that he didn't have force to back up his diplomacy. Uh, the United States had just withdrawn ignominiously from Vietnam. And the whole uh, notion of deploying force had become uh, highly uh, fraught and, and opposed uh, domestically. Uh, so he had to uh, fall back on his guile, his charm, and the power of his arguments. And he was quite brilliant at that, and I detail it in the book, the way that he used his arguments like a battering ram to shape uh, particularly the approach of the Israelis. Uh, but he wasn't unique in that. I think Carter and Baker uh, matched him in, in those uh, tactical uh, techniques. I think his unique contribution was his belief that order was more desirable than peace, but that a stable order which was his objective, required a viable peace process to legitimize that order, to give the Arabs in particular a stake in maintaining the order 
rather than going to war and disrupting it to get their territory back. And his understanding that a viable peace process required Israel to yield Arab territory that it had occupied six years earlier in the 1967 war, but always in a gradual, incremental way. Step-by-step -step diplomacy is what he called it, and that was his unique contribution. Uh, what was his most significant, what was the most significant lesson that we can draw from his experience? I think it is not to overreach. And I say that because those who came after Kissinger knew not Kissinger and uh, went for what he regarded which is the end game, the end of the conflict. Now in Carter's case, uh, standing on the shoulders of Kissinger in terms of the work that he'd done with Egypt, it worked very well. But in all the other cases, it, it turned out quite disastrously. And, and that was, I think, a lesson that Kissinger recognized uh, early on, that American leaders are prone to be attracted to grand objectives, especially in the Middle East, peace, democracy, regime change, changing the world, using our immense power to change the world, reshape it in America's image. That was something that he was highly skeptical about and very wary about. It. He was conservative and believed that they, in doing so, they ran the high risk of destabilizing the regional order. And we only have to look at what happened with the, the effort to uh, remove Saddam Hussein from power in Iraq to understand what he meant. Peace would come eventually, in, in his view, but only if the order could be maintained long enough to exhaust the Arabs and to build Israel's strength so that it could make the ultimate concessions. Uh, when the Arabs were actually ready for peace. Everything needed to be done gradually and incrementally. Now, there's a risk in this lesson of not overreaching uh, because as I show in the book, Kissinger underreached, if there's such a word. He aimed too low. He missed an opportunity to head off the Yom Kippur War. He missed an opportunity to make Israeli-Egyptian peace, which he, I believe he could have done uh, had he... Uh, been prepared to take the risks that Jimmy Carter uh, took. And he uh, missed the opportunity to bring Jordan into the peace process in a way that could have changed dramatically the trajectory of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Was it better to try and fail than not to try at all? This was the question that we faced when we went to Camp David II back in 2000. I was part of Clinton's Middle East peace team. The lesson from Kissinger is that we need to try, but with greater concern for the danger, dangerous consequences of failure. Fascinating. Um, uh, uh, order more desirable than peace, but peace essential as a tool to achieve order. Um, uh, peace process. Peace process. Very good. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you, Martin, and thank you for staying within your time brilliantly. Um, I will now turn to, uh, to, the, to the legacy of President Carter and turn to Stu Eisenstein. Well, that was a really terrific opening, Martin. Thank you. Uh, President Carter had very little foreign policy experience. He was a one-term Georgia governor. He had served briefly on the Trilateral Commission. Uh, and during the campaign, as is often the case, and presidential campaigns, foreign policy in general was certainly de-emphasized. It was all I could do to get a very brief reference to Israel in his announcement speech in 1974. And in June of 1976 in New Jersey, he gave a, a major foreign policy speech on the Middle East and Israel. The only thing he deleted from my draft was a reference to Israel as an ally, but it was an absolute commitment to Israel's security, and turning away from what he thought were the power politics of Nixon, Ford, and Kissinger, pledging never to sacrifice the security or survival of Israel for barrels of oil. He also pledged, and he did, and the secondary Arab economic boycott, and got 70% of the Jewish vote as a Southern Baptist. As so often happens with presidencies, when an election is over, 
presidents have a very different and broader view from the Oval Office than they did when they're cycling for votes. And this happened in spades when uh, Dr. Brzezinski's big Brzezinski became his national security advisor and brought on Bill Quant to be his uh, national security staff person dealing with the Middle East and Cy Vance, the Secretary of State, and the State Department, which at that time was significantly, I wouldn't say anti-Israel, but certainly pro-Arab. His roadmap was initially the 1975 Brookings Report, which not coincidentally, Zbig and Quant had helped uh, draft. It recommended a comprehensive settlement, just the opposite of what Martin is talking about, with all the Arab countries, Israeli withdrawal from all territories occupied in 67 with only minor adjustments, and the Palestinian territories would either become independent or voluntarily associate themselves with Jordan. So priorities changed, and what had not been a priority during the campaign suddenly did. Why was it a priority? First, and this may seem very odd, but it was certainly not the case, he said, and I quote, I had a strong religious motivation to try to bring peace to what I call the Holy Land. There really was a sort of Baptist notion that this was the Holy Land and bringing peace to it was a, a moral, religious, ethical imperative. He had visited Israel once as governor in 1973. It had a real impact on him, by the way, at the invitation of Yitzhak Rabin, uh, who was then the Israeli ambassador in Golda Meir. Uh, second, it was the height of the Cold War. And Bracker Brzezinski convinced him that bringing peace to the region and with the Palestinians would greatly enhance American influence at the expense of the Soviets. And it coincided with a critically important event, Rob, and that is in the early 1970s, Sadat broke with the Soviet Union, expelled their advisors. And so Carter saw reaching for peace in the Middle East as solidifying the move of Egypt and other Arab countries from the Soviet to the US orbit in the Middle East. There was also concern for another Arab oil, uh, oil embargo as it happened after the Yom Kippur War and which wreaked havoc on the U.S. economy. It also was one of the reasons we ended up winning the election against Ford, the aftermath. He did not want to have a repeat of another Arab oil embargo. Also, I think it's fair to say that as great as it was, Kissinger's incremental policy of partial Israeli withdrawals from the Egyptian Sinai had really run its course. Either one went for broke uh, or one tried to maintain a status quo, but Israel was not going to make more incremental withdrawals unless it got something very significant like peace. Carter also, as an engineer, had the notion not only on foreign policy, but domestic welfare reform energy of a comprehensive agreement. He wasn't satisfied with a bilateral Egypt-Israel peace agreement. And he also had something that no other president had brought in that he told me he surprised himself with bringing. Uh, Martin mentioned Kissinger not going to the Arab world. Carter didn't know the Palestinians at all, but he became imbued with their plight, refracting it through his view of the civil rights movement in the South that he had grown up. He actually said to me, remarkably, that he saw them as the blacks of the Middle East and that they were being mistreated more by the Israeli military than the white police were for blacks. A, a dubious statement, but that was his view. He was warned by all of his political advisors and his vice president, Mondale and me, that getting into this Middle East morass was a minefield. And he said to us, I am prepared to lose reelection to bring peace to the region. His change, he changed course, arms sales to the Saudis and to Egypt, doing hoops to try to get Arafat and the PLO into the peace process to accept, which they did not, UN Resolution 242, uh, land for peace. Rabin's first visit as prime minister was a catastrophe. He was the first foreign visitor that Carter had, and it was like oil and water. There's some wonderful anecdotes, which I don't have time to tell, but his biggest concern was that Rabin didn't seem to be as forthcoming as he thought, and Carter didn't understand that he was struggling 
for his own political life and re-election. He made Carter a monumental political mistake while Rabin was still in the United States after the state visit. And that is, as I was at Clinton, Massachusetts with him on March 16th, 1977, unscripted, you can't blame Zbig for this, unscripted, he said, there has to be a homeland for Palestinian refugees who have suffered for many, many years. The notion of a Palestinian homeland was so antithetical to Israel and to the American Jewish community, it caused a huge fracas. And to this day, the Israeli Labor Party, or what's left of it, at least the left, believes that Begin was elected because of that statement. I think you can argue with that, but that is sort of the, the litany that uh, the Israeli left had. What is clear is that not long afterward, May 17th, only two months after that homeland statement, Menachem Begin, after six previous efforts, won and brought a revisionist view uh, with him. A second catastrophic mistake goes right to the heart of Martin's point. He forgot the lesson of Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger did make one effort at a comprehensive peace at Geneva in 1973. Assad refused to participate. It collapsed. Carter somehow thought, if Kissinger failed, I can somehow do it. Zbig convinced him that the way to neutralize the Soviets in the Middle East was to co-opt them into an active peacemaking process, have every party, all 22 Arab states and so forth, involved in Geneva. That absolutely was catastrophic for Israel. Moshe Dayan went to his hotel room uh, and, and, and confronted Carter. Carter had to pull back. The American Jewish community uh, went bonkers with it. It was a painful withdrawal. And what did Sadat then do once that collapsed? Well, people think that his trip to Jerusalem somehow came out of thin air. It did not. Both Begin and Sadat had traveled to Romania and met with their uh, communist uh, dictator, Ceausescu, who wanted to play and did play an important role in convincing each that they had a peace partner. King Hassan of Morocco held sec secret meetings with Diane, who was then foreign minister, and with the deputy foreign minister of Egypt. The head of the Mossad, Hafi, tipped off the Egyptian intelligence about a plot they uncovered for Gaddafi in Libya to assassinate Sadat. And he appreciated obviously getting that. And it, it made him think, well, maybe I do have a peace partner here. So he suggested an international conference with the five UN Security Council members. Carter said, no, that won't work. And then Sadat said, okay, I'm going to do this on my own. I will never get the Egyptian Sinai back if I have to rely on anybody else. And I believe that is exactly the reason he made his historic trip to Jerusalem. But after that, futilely, Israel and Egypt tried to build on his statement, Sadat's, no more wars. What did that mean in concrete terms? How did you put it into a peace context? They couldn't. And so as a last resort and over the objection of virtually every advisor, Jimmy Carter invited them to Camp David for the Camp David Accords. Now, why did Camp David uh, succeed and what can we learn from it? First, it occurred at the height of American power. Uh, we were one of the two superpowers. Egypt had now turned to the United States and Israel had always depended on the United States. Query whether that could work in today's multipolar world. It's generally second, a bad idea for presidents to tie themselves up for almost two weeks personally negotiating because if they fail, it's an enormous blow to their credibility. But he was in fact indispensable without his constant presence, without drafting 22 peace agreements, it would never have worked. Contrast that with John Kerry as Secretary of State in 2013, 2014, where he really didn't have the full engagement of President Obama or Bill Clinton when Mart was involved in Camp David. What does he do in the middle of Camp David too? He goes to the G7 summit and then flies back, doesn't propose his own draft until the last weeks of the administration. So the most, most important lesson, Rob, to me is a president and an administration must be willing to invest enormous time, energy, resources, and political capital. A president or secretary of state with the president's backing has to be willing to crack eggs to make an omelet, to put pressure on 
uh, Israel and the Arab states and to bear the political consequences domestically of doing so. He has to be able to put himself in the shoes of the other side, understanding their history, their limits, their red lines. And that political risk is something he has to do. Now, what is often ignored is that after Camp David, people think, well, that was the end of it. No, Camp David was only a framework. In Camp David, it called for a peace treaty within three months. Six months passed, no peace treaty. Carter, again, and I promise you, over the objection of every single advisor, decided to go to the region, risk his prestige to convert the accord into a peace treaty, which he finally did. Other lessons, he chose an isolated place, Camp David, so he could lock everybody in, avoid them leaking to the press and playing to the home crowd. Dick Holbrook learned that in Bosnia, choosing Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in uh, Dayton, the same lesson that Carter had. Personal touches make a difference. What personal touches here? Carter took Sadat and Begin to the cemetery at Gettysburg, in effect, to reinforce what more wars would mean. He had a Shabbat dinner, all kosher, by the way, at Camp David with the Israeli delegation. And as I'll describe in one second, uh, he, he autographed photographs to eight of Begin's grandchildren. And by the way, as Susan, I'm sure, will recount, he, uh, Jim Baker learned that lesson taking Shevardnadze, the foreign minister of the Soviet Union, uh, to his ranch uh, for German reunification. Setting deadlines is also important. George Mitchell learned that at Good Friday Agreement, setting Good Friday as the deadline. Well, Carter did setting the 13th day at Camp David as the last day, forcing everybody to decide, do we want to walk away from this or make peace? Next, Carter realized that the most inflexible person on the Israeli team was none other than the prime minister himself. And so he went around him at Camp David and dealt with Diane, the foreign minister, Weizmann, the, the defense minister, and critically, Aharon Barak, the legal advisor. And then personalized a photograph to each of Begin's grandchildren the 13th day when Begin said, no more compromises, I'm going home. And he autographed with Bessus for Peace, handed those photographs, saw Begin's eyes tear, he put his bags down and made one last try. Carter also recognized that Sadat, by contrast, was the most flexible on his delegation. Indeed, his own foreign minister resigned in the middle of Camp David. Uh, and so he had to negotiate with Osama al Baz, who was Sadat's chosen legal advisor, and Aharon Barak to reach the deal. With all of that, we sometimes over-personalize negotiations. If there's only the superstar, well, even superstars can't sometimes put rabbits out of the hat. So there has to be a sufficient common ground to reach an agreement. There was between Egypt and, and Israel. They each had their reasons why they were willing to reach a peace agreement. That's not the case and still isn't the case with the Palestinians. So having that common ground is absolutely essential. And then last, and this is Martin's lesson, don't go for a comprehensive agreements. Get what you can get. Don't overshoot. Twice, both Kissinger and then Carter failed with the Soviets. And had the Palestinians been at Camp David, there would have been no Camp David. They were not prepared. The best thing that happened was not having the Palestinians there. Uh, and you oftentimes have to, and here I'll close, defer the toughest issues in order to get an agreement. So they deferred the issue for five years of what to do with the Palestinians. And George Mitchell learned that lesson at uh, the Northern Ireland agreements by deferring what seemed to be the two critical issues. What's the future of Northern Ireland with Ireland, with the UK separately and decommissioning of arms. So one of the things that we take away from this, whether it's at the JCPOA or others, is you get what you can get, don't overshoot, don't overreach, or the whole uh, ball of wax will unravel. And last, you need relentlessly, relentlessly to seek peace. We call it the peace process. The problem is the peace process becomes only a process. You feel good when you just get people there. You need to have someone willing 
to risk the political capital and drive home success and an achievement, even if it's not the full comprehensive piece. And Jimmy Carter learned that lesson. Okay, fascinating. Thank you, Stu. There's a there's a really interesting contrast, obviously, between Henry Kissinger and Jimmy Carter. Um, uh, um, uh, one, 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 one will never mistake uh, the Southern Baptist for uh, uh, the German emigre, um, uh, the German Jewish emigre. Um, uh, and, uh, but yet each of them had enormous achievements um, in the pursuit of um, uh, Arab-Israeli peace. And now we'll turn to Jim Baker, um, um, who the context for whom was also very different than these two um, uh, first uh, peacemakers. Um, he does come to Middle East peacemaking in the wake of great American military victory. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so it's a very different story. Uh, Susan, the floor is yours. Well, uh, before you go, just one, if, again, if you have questions as we get to the next phase of this discussion, please feel free to send them in the Q&A function of your Zoom call or email them directly to me at rsatloff at washingtoninstitute.org. Susan. Thank you so much, Rob. And thank you so much to uh, Stu and Martin. Those are Fantastic presentations. And I think there's, you know, what's really interesting to me is, as Rob said, the context is very different for Jim Baker, uh, an extremely reluctant, uh, I would say, uh, dabbler in the art of Middle East peacemaking. But at the same time, uh, you know, there's a, an interesting through line as well, I think, that I'm hearing from both uh, the Kissinger story and the Carter story. Uh, you know, first of all, like Henry Kissinger, Jim Baker, when he became Secretary of State, wanted nothing to do with Middle East peacemaking. So I think that's an important, uh, you know, sort of marker to start out with. Uh, he did not have uh, the zeal uh, of an ideologue or of uh, even the religious uh, motivation, although he is very religious. He did not have uh, a drive in and of itself uh, to see himself as a Middle East peacemaker. And one of the interesting things when he and uh, George W. Bush came in to office in 1989 is he was very clear with his aides in laying out a marker and saying, I'm not going to be like George Shultz, vainly fought, flying around the Middle East. That's exactly what he told his advisors. I uh, uh, forget it. I don't want to do it. There's nothing to be gained there. It's just a waste of time. Dennis Ross, whom, of course, everyone uh, I'm sure on this this uh, discussion knows very well, said to him, well, you know, sir, basically, you might not want to be involved in the Middle East, but the Middle East wants to be involved with you. Uh, but there, more or less, is actually where the matter stood, because what I want to talk about today is really the, the, the overarching context. Can you rip away? Is Middle East peacemaking by American secretaries of state, can it be divorced from the historical moment and the context in which these figures operated? And, you know, I think in the case of Jim Baker, you have to pretty much come down uh, uh, on a solid note that uh, really the events of this period, 1989 to 1992 when he was Secretary of State. This was the hinge point. This was the, the, the collapse and, and decline and fall of the Soviet empire, uh, if you will. It was the end of the Cold War and of decades uh, really of uh, superpower competition were coming to an end. That was the overarching context for Baker's entire tenure as Secretary of State. And of course, you know, November 9th, 1989 was the day the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, which uh, actually was also extremely consequential for Middle East peacemaking, as well as for you know almost everything else when it came to the world order at that time. And so, uh, by the way, Jim Baker and his staff also did not anticipate that event. He did not see himself as a Middle East peacemaker. He also did not see himself as the Secretary of State who would end up helping to midwife the reunification of Germany. This was an aspiration of uh, uh, American policymakers, of course, and American politicians for decades. There was a famous memo written by Baker's staff uh, uh, in, in the early days after the inauguration in 1989, in which they looked at the possibility of German unification and concluded it was a fantasy and a pipe dream and not likely to happen in their lifetime. And then, of course, just a few months later, this epical event happened. Uh, Baker's key partner, uh, uh, has become at this point already the Soviet foreign minister, Edward Shevardnadze, as Stuart uh, mentioned, this was a very unlikely but close bond 
that Baker forged with Shevardnadze and that he and Bush had with Gorbachev as well. In some ways, when you look at certainly the state of the relationship today between the United States and Russia, between Vladimir Putin and a whole succession of American presidents, uh, you know, the relationship between Baker and Bush and Gorbachev and Shevardnadze was much closer, much more frank in many ways. Uh, this was a, a, an unraveling world in which uh, the Kissingerian imperative for stability uh, was almost impossible to see since, uh, you know, things were destabilizing every minute and nobody really knew where, where uh, things were going to end up. So that also, of course, was an opportunity for the United States. And, you know, it's interesting that the U.S. had at this particular moment in time a secretary of state and a president uh, who were both fundamentally extremely cautious uh, you know, who, who didn't perhaps have, uh, you know, the tendency to speak in broad Kissingerian terms about uh, world orders. Uh, uh, Jim Baker, uh, if you gave him a pop quiz on the Treaty of Westphalia, he probably would fail it. Uh, <laughs> even today, it's, uh, you know, he's not going to give you a lecture about Metternich. However, uh, he and Baker, I mean, he and Bush shared, I think this is extremely important, uh, shared this fundamental kind of old fashioned small C conservative sense of, uh, you know, do no harm, uh, stewards of an order at a time, even when that was changing. And that, that was a, essentially the fundamental values that they bought to. And it was part of why Baker was so reluctant, frankly, uh, to engage in the Middle East. So why am I talking about the Soviet Union and great power uh, politics if we're supposed to be talking about Middle East peacemaking today? Because I, I think there really is the inescapable context for Jim Baker's involvement in the Middle East. So he tells Dennis Ross early on, I don't want anything to do with it. And Ross, who would later become well known as a Middle East um, negotiator, he was Baker's chief Soviet advisor. And of course, that was the consuming uh, uh, task in the first couple of years. What changed? Uh, well, Saddam Hussein changed and Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait. And uh, this turned into, as Rob pointed out, this major US military intervention, successful uh, military intervention and building of really a kind of unprecedented coalition of allies in the Middle East. And, you know, so Baker threw himself into that. He was very famous. His uh, Tin Cup tour, as they called it, I think is still uh, well known in the annals of American diplomacy as possibly the only time the Secretary of State was so successful at flying around and not only enlisting allies for an American military action, but it actually became the first war in American history that almost made money off of the war by getting the allies to fund so much of it. Uh, so Baker gets involved, uh, you know, against his better instincts. Uh, and that opens up the opportunity. American victory in the first Persian Gulf War, it opens up opportunity. And Baker, uh, who is, if nothing, if not a canny corporate lawyer uh, and political negotiator, understands uh, in fact, he tells his staff in a memo that's in our book, we must, all caps, not his style, by the way, all caps. So uh, he wasn't a tweeter uh, <laughs> and he was not uh, a, a, a giver of uh, all caps diktats to his staff. But he writes on this memo, we must use our leverage now. And he highlights that, underscores it uh, and says now on the Middle East. So he sees this opening, slim as it might be, to use the capital that the United States has acquired in the region. So that's one factor is, you know, the savviness to understand the timing. Uh, now, interestingly, Jim Baker would actually, uh, didn't have the closest relationship with Henry Kissinger. Kissinger looked down on him, I think. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, years, a few years after the fact, Kissinger said, uh, well, of Baker, he had a less complicated approach to the world order than I did, which I guess is a flaming insult uh, uh, in uh, Kissinger speak. Uh, Baker, he hated Baker, actually. It's a funny story. Going back to the 1976 campaign when Jim Baker first, uh, you know, sort of enters politics in, in, in midlife in his 40s in, in that 1976 campaign, and he's working for Jerry Ford, rises really in the course of one year from obscure position at the Commerce Department. 
to be running Ford's campaign. And he is sent out, uh, this is early on in his political career, he's sent out to Oklahoma, uh, not the A-list fundraisers, to do a fundraiser for Ford's campaign that year. And the controversy at this time was over Henry Kissinger. Um, uh, his detente policy was very controversial uh, among hardline conservative Republicans. Uh, and there was a huge uproar. Would uh, Ford keep Kissinger as his secretary of state uh, in a second term? And Baker, telling the audience of uh, conservative Oklahomans what he thinks they want to hear, says, oh, no, absolutely not. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll basically get rid of Kissinger. Well, uh, this was needless to say before the social media era, and Jim Baker somehow thought that what happened in Oklahoma could stay in Oklahoma. Needless to say, even back then, it took a couple of days, uh, but uh, word filtered back to Washington in the form of an Associated Press report. Henry Kissinger was livid. Uh, who the hell is Jim Baker, he said uh, very memorably. And by the way, if you ask Henry Kissinger to this day about that incident, he is well aware of it <laughs> uh, and remembers. But it's not a detour to mention this uh, because the truth is that both Kissinger and Baker, I think, were extremely pragmatic, uh, uh, brilliant, tactical negotiators. And they really looked down, I think, probably on many of the successor presidents and secretaries of state who expended effort in, in a kind of what they would say is a, a willy nilly way in the Middle East. And I, I think that's a big takeaway for Baker is, you know, use your leverage now, but you better be sure that you really have it and understand what the moment is. And, you know, wasting time in endless rounds of negotiations for their own sake was not something that he would have recommended uh, to any of his successors. And I think that's probably true of Kissinger. Now, I want to get on uh, to the question. So let me just leave you with, uh, you know, the real bottom line in my view, which is uh, obviously Jim Baker did not make uh, a lasting Middle East peace. His accomplishment was uh, uh, essentially uh, a proof of concept rather than uh, a, an actual longstanding thing. And that leads you know, to the other point. So he convened the Madrid Peace Conference as a direct result, I think, of the opportunity that the United States had in the wake of the first Gulf War. And that involved an enormous heavy lift of hours of what he called bladder diplomacy, uh, you know, with uh, Assad in Syria. It involved, uh, you know, working endlessly uh, and everybody had a, a price to exact, basically just to be willing to sit down in Madrid uh, in the same room with the Israeli delegation to bring the Arab world together there. Essentially though, again, it wasn't a lasting uh, peace. It wasn't even a lasting framework for peace. It was a proof of concept. And what intervened? Well, Jim Baker would argue if you asked him, and I, I think there's a lot to, to, to this argument that in the end, domestic politics uh, always drives uh, our foreign policy, as well as our domestic policy. And, you know, <laughs> the ultimate domestic politics is getting thrown out of office. And that is what happened to George H.W. Bush and to Jim Baker, who never had the chance uh, as a secretary of state in a second Bush term to pursue uh, the lasting peace that he thought was within reach. And of course, then the Oslo Accords came about, uh, which were not midwifed by Baker, but he certainly uh, potentially could have taken advantage of that moment. I think along with the tragic assassination uh, you know, of Israel's peacemaker, prime minister, uh, this should rank as one of the great might have beens of Middle East peacemaking, whether because the United States had, I, I, I think most would agree, Democrat and Republican, a uniquely gifted negotiator in Jim Baker at this moment in time, whether in a second Bush term, he could have uh, uh, you know, changed the course of the history that we're all too familiar with. You know, it's, it's, it's an unknown, uh, but I would leave you with that as an interesting thing to chew over. And then the bottom line though, of uh, sometimes you're in one of those hinge moments of history and what was possible in 1989 and 1990 and 1991 for the United States, uh, is no longer the framework in which we're operating as a global power in the Middle East. Terrific. Um, absolutely. The, uh, um, uh, the concept of um, uh, context um, matters uh, uh, for all of the three 
um, uh, peacemakers about whom we're talking today. Um, uh, and we, we have three different models, three different experiences. And there's so many areas that we could go into. Um, I've received a bunch of questions directly from uh, um, from viewers, uh, some on, some on uh, the Zoom, some directly to my email, and I have a bunch of uh, issues that I'd like to get into. Um, let, let's start with, um, with the question of leverage that, that you referred to, um, Susan. Um, uh, and each of you uh, um, actually have episodes of, um, uh, of your peacemaker using leverage. Um, uh, uh, in different in different moments and different opportunities, um, uh, and you and I want to connect this with the question of um, uh, uh, the, the the lesson that that you Martin and you Stu both came away with about your peacemaker, which is don't overshoot. You know, get what you can get. Um, uh, they reach that at different stages and different moments and in different ways. Um, so uh, I want to ask uh, Martin and Stu about the use of leverage to achieve the objectives and Susan in a different um, in a different way the question really is did Baker undershoot given the enormous leverage that we had in 92 and as you say all he did in historical terms was set the table for somebody else's negotiation which never actually happened um, did we misuse the leverage to to act to achieve a lasting breakthrough um, how did Kissinger and Carter conceive of American leverage um, uh, to achieve their objectives. Do you think that they used it wisely, um, husbanding for future deals, using it appropriately to achieve the deals that they did achieve? Um, uh, so let's go back. We'll start again with Martin on this round. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Kissinger uh, definitely believed in uh, the need for leverage and uh, definitely used it. Uh, unhesitatingly, uh, most notably uh, in the war itself in 1973, he used Israel's force. He, as I said before, he didn't have force coming off the uh, Vietnam War himself to use as leverage, but he used the pressure of Israeli military force to get the Soviets and the Egyptians and the Syrians to agree to a ceasefire on Kissinger's terms. And that proved to be uh, very successful. Uh, he also was very conscious from the war on that Israel, the war itself made Israel heavily dependent on the United States for resupply, for political support. Israel was isolated. There was the Arab arms embargo, putting pressure on the Europeans and our uh, Asian allies to abandon Israel in favor of the Arab position on withdrawal to the 67 lines. So Israel was, is, Israel was in bad shape coming off that war, notwithstanding its, its military achievements. And uh, the dependence on the United States was something that he was quite uh, willing to use to basically uh, bend <coughs> the Israelis to his will. <clears throat> in a later uh, version of this when he was dealing with Yitzhak Rabin as prime minister and trying to convince the Israelis to give up the strategic passes in Sinai and the oil fields in Sinai. Uh, he uh, withheld arms, uh, new arms sales to Israel for four months. Um, I don't think you could do that for four days in the current uh, environment in, in Washington. Um, but he did it for four months. He earned the ire of the uh, American Jewish community and Israel's supporters uh, on Capitol Hill. But he, with the backing of Ford, withstood, withstood that pressure and, and applied the pressure to the Israelis in a way that in the end, they bent to his will. And, and so I think that, that uh, you see throughout uh, his looking for leverage, uh, acquiring the leverage, and then using the leverage uh, to achieve his objectives. But I want to emphasize again what I said at the beginning, which is his objectives were uh, not big asks. Uh, you know, he wasn't trying to get Israel to withdraw completely from the Sinai. He eschewed that idea, even though there's some evidence that, that Rabin was willing to take a much bigger step. 
if he got peace in return. But Kiss Kissinger was always looking for the digestible concession on Israel's part. But in going for that, he didn't hesitate to use leverage. Okay, very good. Uh, Stu, how did Jimmy Carter conceive of uh, using leverage to get what he wanted? Well, interestingly, he did not do what George H. W. Bush and Baker later did, which is, you know, in effect, deny loan guarantees for housing for the rush of Soviet Jews. He never threatened to cut off arms, but he used leverage in other ways. First, the very leverage of the prestige of the president of the United States, the fact that he was willing to inject himself at Camp David and then go to Jerusalem to conclude the treaty would put Begin in a very difficult position if he turned him down. I mean, here was the president of the country upon whom you most depended. So putting his personal prestige was a great risk, but it was also leverage. Second, we sold, yes, arms to the Saudis and to Egypt, but we kept Israel's qualitative military advantage by selling the most sophisticated F-15s to, to Israel during this time. Third, to seal the treaty itself, we used leverage in the following ways. First, Israel was concerned, Rob, that if they pulled out of the Sinai, they would lose access to the oil wells and Israel had no source of energy at that point. They hadn't made discoveries in the Mediterranean. We guaranteed them, and I negotiated this personally with uh, Yitzhak uh, Modai, the energy minister, that we would provide at below market rates any oil that Sadat, once he took over the Sinai, might deny uh, Israel. So in all of these ways, we were using our own uh, leverage, and we were making it clear that this was of supreme importance to their most important ally, that we were willing to back it up with sophisticated arms to them, we were willing to back it up with oil to them, and we were willing to put a multinational force, which is there to this very day, in the Sinai to make sure that Egypt could not, in effect, uh, take advantage of the Israeli withdrawal and invade Israel. So in, in all of those ways, we did use uh, leverage without actually threatening in, at any time to cut off or reduce military assistance uh, or economic assistance. Interesting. Very good. Thank you. Now, Susan, in, 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 in the Baker case, I mean, we're having policy disputes in, the, in Washington today about, you know, a few hundred troops in, uh, uh, in Syria or something. People tend to forget we had 500,000 troops um, in the Middle East um, uh, when, when, uh, um, uh, when the United States uh, evicted Saddam from, from Kuwait. That's an awful lot of leverage. Did he use it wisely? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a great and provocative question. I, I think one important question is, uh, you know, could Baker have pushed the Arab allies uh, you know, more, or, you know, was the ask fundamentally a process ask, right, to show up uh, in, participate in a process as opposed to do something. And, you know, what he anticipated is what didn't happen, which is a second term, which I think is, you know, an ironclad rule of peacemaking that everyone has, has pointed out here, which is take what you can get when you can get it, because you might not have the future opportunity. So I do think this is a classic case uh, not perhaps so much of failing to use leverage as of uh, failing to understand uh, that the moment was potentially going to go away. Uh, it, you know, interestingly, the thing I didn't mention that's very important is the context of U.S. Uh, politics and the Republican Party's relationship with Israel, and that that was also a very, very different uh, situation than the one we have right now. And, and Stu alluded to this. Uh, in that Baker and Bush were very willing, much more so willing uh, than their successors, uh, and certainly the most recent Republican administration to pressure Israel. Uh, and uh, both Baker and Bush were seen as, uh, you know, sort of an older tradition of the Republican Party being closer to the Arabs, more willing to publicly criticize Israel. And in fact, both Baker and Bush did so very controversially uh, and criticized uh, Israeli settlements, 
and showed, in fact, that they were willing to uh, play hardball. Uh, they were not on good terms with the government of Prime Minister Shamir uh, when uh, Bush first came into office. And in fact, uh, uh, Jim Baker has a distinction of having made uh, a young deputy foreign minister of Israel, uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, persona non grata at his State Department. He literally banned a young Netanyahu from even physically setting foot in uh, Foggy Bottom. So that gives you a sense of how acrimonious uh, and stressed relations were already uh, between uh, the leaders of the United States and Israel at this moment of time when peacemaking then suddenly kind of gets put on the agenda of the Secretary of State who didn't want to have it on his agenda. So there is an interesting question of with uh, already a lot of suspicion directed toward Bush and Baker in Israel, could they have asked their allies for more uh, concessions? It's, it's hard to see. Uh, and interestingly, it was as hard to get the Israelis to come to the Mid Madrid peace talks as it was, or certainly they negotiated uh, very, very aggressively with Baker, uh, uh, much to his frustration, uh, as much as the uh, Arab uh, leaders did in agreeing to come to the table. So it seems to me that the moment that was missed here uh, might not have been conceptually on Baker's part as much as it was uh, you know, of uh, making the mistake of thinking that you have longer in power than you do. <laughs> can I jump right. in, uh, okay. Rob? Can yeah. I just jump in? Yeah, on sure, this? please. Because I think uh, the contrast is interesting. First of all, although it's true that Baker came off a war, it wasn't an Arab Israeli war, or to the extent that it was, it was one in which the United States had already used a lot of leverage to get Israel not to engage in the war. Uh, whereas Kissinger came off a war, which was an Arab Israeli war, in which the armies were still essentially engaged and he had to find a way to disengage them. And there was an urgency as well as this plasticity that I was describing, which he could use to, to manipulate the two sides in a way that I think wasn't available uh, to Baker. But the second point I want to make is if you look at, at the way that Baker used leverage, the way that Carter used leverage and the way that Kissinger used leverage, in each case, when they went up against Israel, Israel, in the end, bowed to America. If they, were, if they were prepared to stand up to the heat, in the end, and that was true, of, of course, uh, with Obama and Netanyahu, that in the end, the all-powerful uh, Israeli lobby or so on ends up not being quite as powerful. It all depends on the uh, willingness of the uh, American leaders to bear the costs and it is costly of such a confrontation. I would just say, if you look at political costs, Jimmy Carter, again, a Southern Baptist uh, governor, won about 70% of the Jewish vote in 1976 against President uh, Ford, against uh, Ronald Reagan, having brought peace uh, to Israel and its most powerful neighbor, created the Holocaust Museum, uh, broken the Arab boycott, uh, and uh, done so many other positive things for Israel, he got 40% of the Jewish vote, the lowest percentage any Democratic candidate for president has gotten in modern times. Why? Because he was perceived as having pushed, as he did, very hard on Menachem Begin. And Begin, although he did agree, uh, Martin and Susan, he made it clear that he didn't like to be pressed that way. And he tried everything right. possible to explain why he had agreed to what he did agree to at Camp David and, and Egypt. So Carter paid a political cost. He was willing to pay it. The results are historic, but one should not imagine that he failed to pay a political cost. It was not the reason by any means, the sole reason why he lost, that's for sure. But that still rankles him to this very day in his 97th year that he got 40% of the Jewish vote and champion Soviet jury and got uh, Sharansky I mean, out from being killed, et cetera. There is, an, uh, there is an interesting commonality among all three of these cases that um, all three of the administrations about which we're talking lost the next election. So, uh, you know, uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't Nixon and Kissinger, but it was Ford and Kissinger lost after Nixon's efforts, right. after Kissinger's efforts in 74, 75. And 
Um, Carter lost and and uh, Bush did not get a second term. Um, I don't think we can lay it all at the basis of their Middle East peacemaking, of course, but uh, it is an interesting commonality. Now, now one structural contrast that we I, I did want to ask about is we are, of course, talking about two secretaries of state and one president. And there is a fundamental difference between being the elected president and being the appointed and confirmed secretary of state. Um, so can we say a word about the relationship between uh, president and secretary of state in the relevant administration um, uh, and um, uh, how much that mattered to the success or lack thereof of the diplomacy um, uh, uh, and the, the, just the effort to achieve a certain worldview um, that animated the diplomacy in, in each of these cases. Um, here, let, 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 let's work backwards. Um, Susan, let me start with you with, uh, with the Baker-Bush relationship. Yeah, no, I think that's an important one to spotlight. Uh, unlike, say, the the Kerry Obama uh, most recent experience that you know Martin can you know sort of tell us in, in great and agonizing detail about, uh, you know, Baker and Bush really were. Uh, a partnership that that is almost historically uh, 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 without other precedent. Uh, in in some ways, they were the closest Secretary of State and American President that we've had. Uh, Peter and I have an argument about Madison and Jefferson, but uh, you know, really, Madison was sort of a protege of uh, Jefferson's uh, rather than a peer. Um, May this be the worst argument in your relationship. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, trust me. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, the bottom line is that Baker and Bush were seen uh, 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 as as peers, as um, uh, speaking for each other in a way that immeasurably enhanced Baker's ability to conduct diplomacy on uh, Bush's behalf. Everyone knew he spoke for the president. Everyone knew that uh, uh, Bush was going to back him up. Uh, and that was an extremely important part of uh, his tenure as secretary of state. Uh, it wasn't the reason that he was a great deal maker and negotiator. Uh, uh, and in fact, there were many interesting examples as we uh, worked on the book where Baker actually uh, differed in, in, in minor but significant ways from Bush or where he pushed Bush uh, reluctantly. Interestingly, actually German unification uh, is one of those examples where Baker uh, was a little bit out front of uh, Bush and really, uh, you know, sort of pushed him at key moments or, you know, even exceeded his brief uh, in a pushing uh, European allies to go along with his plan for German unification. Uh, when back in Washington, uh, Bush and Scowcroft, uh, the National Security Advisor, were not 100% on board. When it came to the Middle East, I think that, um, you know, Baker really had the diplomatic uh, proxy of Bush. And he, you know, Bush was the one who was just fundamentally offended by uh, Saddam's violation of international order and the invasion of Kuwait. I think maybe it's possible to say that had Baker been president and not Bush, uh, he might not have uh, gone as quickly to the idea that uh, there was only a military solution to the, the invasion of Kuwait. But uh, nonetheless, uh, Baker really was the kind of indispensable player when it came to the, the rounds of what he called shuttle diplomacy that he engaged with both with the Gulf War and on the matter of Israel and, 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 and Palestine. Now, I, I just, I wanted to address this issue because I think it is a really important one. Uh, you, know, you all may have thought, I think perhaps more deeply uh, and have answers to this question, but for me, it remains a question and, and, and a really important one that you've raised in, in the questions today, which is to what extent, uh, you know, did Baker uh, fail to uh, demand more even of the Israelis, uh, given that they showed that they were willing to challenge them. Was this the one moment uh, when US policy you know, could have actually acted in more concrete ways uh, to uh, stop the growth of the settlements or to push Arabs who were fundamentally in US debt at this moment in time, uh, you know, the Saudis, uh, for example, uh, was this the moment to have pushed much harder uh, for concrete concessions rather than I'm willing to talk to you type concessions. I don't know the answer to that, uh, but it's, it's, it's an interesting question. And then the final thought I want to leave you with was when it comes to that moment and was it a wasted moment, I do think you have to look at the situation with the Soviet Union. And uh, Bush and Baker used 
this moment of rapprochement with Shevardnadze and Gorbachev when Saddam invaded Kuwait, there was only known example actually of the US and the Soviet Union issuing a joint statement condemning this move and uh, seeming to work together in the UN Security Council. Um, remember that Gorbachev was almost toppled in a hardline coup uh, and then the Soviet Union itself unraveled in exactly the period when Jim Baker turned to Middle East peacemaking. Uh, it might have been only with Boris Yeltsin and a really reduced uh, post-Soviet Russia uh, uh, that it would have been possible to really reorder the Middle East in a more lasting way. Uh, and in some ways, just as George H.W. Bush was politically vulnerable and actually lost election, Mikhail Gorbachev was enormously vulnerable uh, and was practically toppled by a hardline coup. Uh, and believe me, giving away more in the Middle East uh, would have only accelerated that process by which the hardliner sought uh, to end his his rule over the Soviet Union. Very so Rob, let me, uh, if I may, add a couple of points. When Jim Baker spoke, everyone knew he was speaking for the President of the United States. When Kissinger spoke, everyone knew he was speaking for Nixon. When John Kerry spoke in his at peace effort, it was quite clear he was not necessarily doing so for the President of the United States at the time. When Cy Vance tried after Sadat's historic trip to Jerusalem to try to get the parties together before Camp David, he was certainly not the charismatic uh, strategic thinker that Kissinger was or the tactician that Baker was. But also, it was clear he was not necessarily speaking for the president. The president himself had to put his prestige on the line at Camp David, he himself. And one last point I want to talk about on leverage. There was a huge debate within the Carter administration about how to deal with Begin. This was a new character. He was not the Labor Party person. He had a nationalistic uh, vision of controlling all of the Palestinian territories from the Mediterranean to uh, the Jordan River and, and to some extent even east of the Jordan River. There was a whole group, our Ambassador Sam Lewis, Vice President Mondale, Ham Jordan, the top political advisor, myself, who argued that the way to deal with Begin was by a, a, a sweet approach, by using honey, incentives, appealing to his sense of history. Uh, and on the other hand, Big and Carter used vinegar, hard press, push. Uh, and so that's the leverage that he ended up uh, using. It's one of the reasons that he got an agreement, but also lost uh, so heavily politically. So when a secretary of state is involved, it's critical that he or she be seen as really speaking for the president. And if the president's going to get involved, which I think, again, is a rarity, uh, that president has to do so with his eyes or her eyes open to the political risks of doing it. But if they do and they really are committed, it's very hard for Israel to turn its back on the president of the United States. Uh, Martin, I, I see your head nodding with, uh, with those observations. Well, Kissinger, of course, was in a different situation. First of all, Nixon was preoccupied uh, with Watergate. Uh, his relationship with Nixon was nothing like uh, the Bush-Baker relationship. When it came to the Middle East, Nixon, with his anti-Semitic uh, views, regarded Kissinger as in Israel's pocket and didn't want him involved in the Middle East at all. For the first three years, Kissinger had to maneuver around uh, that uh, reality. Uh, and then when he got control of it, uh, Nixon became so uh, tied down uh, with his Watergate woes that Kissinger, in effect, became president for foreign policy. And that was what the New York Times labeled him as. And so he had, in effect, uh, the powers of the presidency in his hands. But because the presidency was so weakened, whenever he would kind of draft a letter uh, in Nixon's name, and he did it a lot um, in terms of trying to move the Israelis in particular, they didn't take it seriously. Uh, so he didn't have, he, he, he had a disadvantage in the fact that he had a weakened president. Then with Ford, 
uh, essentially Ford was an ingenue. He didn't know about the Middle East. Kissinger had already had all these successes under his belt. And so Ford was willing to defer to Kissinger. He essentially uh, remained the president for foreign policy with Ford. Uh, but the same thing happened when he would draft threatening notes from Ford. The Israelis would always know that it was Kissinger who was drafting this, not Ford. And, and so they didn't take it seriously. In fact, as I show in the book, Ford was engaged and Ford um, took a strong position uh, and stood up to Israel strongly. But it wasn't clear to the Israelis that that was in fact the case. And I think they would have uh, respected it more if they had understood that. Um, but because Kissinger had become such a powerful figure, um, they saw him just, just as, as uh, the, the one that was kind of using um, the president for his own purposes. And they tended to discount it as a result. Um, so I have too many questions in from, uh, from potential uh, questioners to be able to get to them all. Uh, I'm just going to mention a couple of them and then ask you the one that I want you to answer, just so you can, uh, our viewers can at least think about um, how, uh, uh, how these issues um, uh, would reverberate among these three peacemakers. One person, uh, one very prominent uh, 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 a woman journalist wrote me in saying, um, isn't it interesting that we're talking about three male peacemakers in the Middle East? Um, would the issue of gender or would um, uh, have made any difference to any of the achievements um, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that we saw were made in the 70s, 80s? Um, uh, that question. Then um, uh, somebody said to me a uh, question, all these achievements occurred in a time when democracy was not an issue or it doesn't seem to have been a major issue in American foreign policy. Um, uh, would, were any of your uh, principles um, uh, uh, even uh, thinking of the relevance of uh, democracy? Uh, or whether we were dealing with um, democracies in trying to achieve any of the breakthroughs uh, that they achieved? And, and how might they be um, uh, addressing these issues in today's environment when the issues of democracy and human rights are so much more on the agenda than they were uh, 30 years ago? Um, but I'm going to ask uh, each of you to, to focus on a question that that Dennis Ross sent in um, after hearing his name cited in this uh, in this conversation, which is which is really to ask um, how each of you could channel your peacemaker for today's environment. Um, we obviously have a very different environment in 2021 that we had in the 70s and the 80s. Um, uh, um, uh, um, all of you are, are are conversant with our with the Middle East uh, situation today. Um, how would your peacemaker um, uh, uh, approach today's um, uh, um, uh, calcified um, uh, Israeli-Palestinian relationship, but blossoming and hopeful Arab-Israeli relationship in the wake of the Abraham Accords and the, the, the almost daily news of some new Arab-Israeli agreement um, uh, just today. It's the Moroccan-Israeli defense agreement, uh, public uh, Arab-Israeli defense agreement for the first time ever. Um, so how would your peacemaker channel today's situation? Um, uh, Stu, let's start with you for this. Well, um, I think that President Carter always had a sort of rosy view of his ability to get parties together if he could simply get him in a room and convince them. But I think that having gone through the hard lessons of a failure of the comprehensive agreement, of settling for an Egypt-Israel peace and a vague statement of full autonomy at uh, Camp David for the Palestinians, he would recognize that the parties now are so far apart that he would, I think, reluctantly, and it would take a lot of <laughs> convincing, that he would have to follow the, the Kissinger model, perhaps the Jim Baker model, and look for smaller steps to build confidence, to build peace. I mean, you just, even using the power of the presidency, trying to get uh, the Palestinians who are so hopelessly divided and so weak on their side, and the Israelis who do not see the need to fundamentally change their policy with respect to the West Bank uh, and having a, a, a very diverse cabinet, I don't think he would leap into uh, anything approaching a major agreement. He would hopefully build on 
the Abraham Accords, uh, broaden it perhaps ultimately to the Saudis. I think he would work very hard, as I did, by the way, during the Clinton administration when I was Under Secretary of State for Economic Affairs and Deputy Treasury Secretary on the economic dimension, trying to make life better for the Palestinians, trying to give more freedom of movement within the West Bank, more investment in so-called Area C, where a lot of the, the agricultural wealth and mineral wealth of the territories are two Palestinians, more joint ventures, uh, reinstate uh, perhaps the uh, qualifying industrial zones, which provide more uh, incentives for investment by Israeli and uh, non-Israeli companies to get duty-free treatment back to the U.S. Smaller steps to begin very carefully to build trust, but not to leap uh, over the cliff when the parties are so hopelessly divided. I would hope that that's the position he would take. I wouldn't guarantee it. <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, Susan, uh, channel Jim Baker in the current environment. Yeah, well, I think uh, he absolutely, if it's more of a question mark with Carter, I think it's less of a question mark with Baker. He would say, uh, you know, you can't make peace if you don't have somebody to make peace with. And he would certainly be very, very skeptical uh, about engaging in, you know, complicated rounds of negotiations between, uh, you know, or, or with the U.S. as a mediator between Israel and the Palestinians, given uh, you know, the lack of uh, a viable uh, uh, leader with whom to make peace. I think, however, he would see the opportunities that exist right now uh, uh, around the region in their deals uh, in various stages with Israel, uh, not just the recognition that's already taken place uh, with the UAE uh, uh, and others. But uh, one question I have is whether Baker might see this as a moment in which uh, you could tie together uh, economic deal making and uh, pushing uh, uh, Arabs to uh, resume thinking about uh, Palestine and the Palestinians uh, as part of those negotiations. I mean, Martin, I think, has rightly pointed out uh, a number of times when I've been in these conversations with him that, you know, one of the challenge of the so-called Abraham Accords is potentially delinking uh, 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 the question of Israel's relations with its Arab neighbors from the question of the, the Palestinians. And, uh, you know, would there be a way that Baker might pursue, I think, uh, to put that question back on the table uh, and where the U.S. could make some concrete steps? But I, my basic view is that he would be extremely wary of getting involved uh, in pointless negotiations uh, and back and forth at this moment in time. Okay, and uh, Martin, uh, Channel Kissinger 2021. Martin, you're... Uh... An old trick. Uh, this is a Kissingerian moment. Uh, and it starts, first of all, as everything with Henry Kissinger, it's a um, question of a balance of power. And he would want to address the larger challenge of establishing an equilibrium in the balance of power when Iran is is kind of moving towards a nuclear threshold uh, and uh, threatening all sorts of destabilizing activities. Uh, for him, you know, the, the Abraham Accords, to the extent that they manifest an Israeli-Arab uh, common interest in countering Iran is perfect foundations for, for building a stable uh, balance of power uh, on the side of Israel and the Sunni Arab states against Iran. But when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, issue, there, uh, you know, his whole approach of step-by-step -step incrementalism, uh, I think, uh, applies very well. First of all, you've got the Israeli government that can't agree on what the final status should be. Uh, half of them want a Palestinian state, half of them oppose it, and want to annex the territory. Uh, so. In those circumstances, as uh, Susan says, there's no, there's no willingness to jump to a, a final peace agreement on the Israeli part, mm -hmm. but there is a willingness to take steps, just as Kissinger would envisage. Uh, but the difference is that Kissinger, as I said at the outset, always believed that the peace process, this incremental step-by-step -step process, had to have a territorial dimension to it. 
in order for it to work to legitimize the order, there needed to be territorial concessions, digestible ones, on the part of Israel. So I think the, the challenge of applying Kissingerian principles here is to, to get the Israeli government to see that it needs to add a territorial component to the steps that it is taking. And I think that that is, that is what's missing at the moment, but that is what, what a Kissingerian approach would require. And if that were to happen, then I think that it has a chance of reinstating some hope uh, on the Palestinian side that a Palestinian state could eventually actually meet their, their aspirations. Um, final point, if I may, and this is about underreaching rather than overreaching. As I argue in the book, Kissinger before the 1973 war was very satisfied with the status quo did not take Sadat seriously, did not imagine he would go to war. If he did, he'd get clobbered. And so he was content to, to sit back and, and relax, believing that the status quo would last. That is somewhat situation that we are in today, with everybody assuming that the situation between the Israelis and the Palestinians, particularly in the West Bank, is, is going to last forever, um, that the status quo is sustainable and that both sides have a stake in it and it will last. Uh, and, and the Kissingerian lesson from 73 is you should always expect the unexpected, that it can blow, and I believe it probably will blow if we don't follow a Kissingerian approach to uh, establish an incremental peace process. That's credible. All right, uh, fascinating. Um, so, you know, you, one can never take uh, uh, history as determinative, uh, but we can certainly take history as educational. And uh, um, I think uh, we have all, uh, and I want to thank all of you for, for, for distilling some of the most important and most useful lessons from uh, respectively Henry Kissinger, uh, Jimmy Carter, and James Baker, uh, told brilliantly in your three um, different biographies of, uh, of these peacemakers. Um, uh, and uh, we, we, we need to mix and match to see where these lessons apply most appropriately here in uh, the end of 2021. Uh, with that, I'm going to thank all of you. Uh, thank all of our participants um, online, on Zoom, on various platforms. Um, I want to wish everyone, uh, um, uh, uh, Martin, Susan, uh, and Stu, um, a very happy Thanksgiving. And so from the Washington Institute family to yours, wherever you are, we wish you a very joyous and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Thank happy you. Thanksgiving, everybody. Thanks so much.